This is a mechanism of disease map on migraines. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of migraines. As in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color-coded according to this legend that you see here at the top right. Now let's get started. Let's first center ourselves around the initiation of the migraine, and I'll first work back to the etiology, talk about the various etiology and the theories of how migraines start, and then work into the manifestations and kind of the stepwise progression through the stages of migraines. Now the etiology here is tricky. It's incompletely understood, and it's kind of a hodgepodge of biochemical pathways and clinical features, clinical triggers that have been associated with migraines. And that's, um, that's our current understanding, and I'm trying to be as complete and succinct as possible. So as I mentioned, I'll discuss some potential triggers, I'll discuss some pathways that have been associated with migraines, and some other factors that contribute to the initiation of migraines. Let's start with the triggers. Alcohol and nicotine are two drugs that have been associated with migraines. There are also a bunch of foods that also have been labeled as triggers. These include citrus fruits, dairy products like yogurt, cheese, and uh, milk. Foods that contain tyramine like chocolate and red wine have also been associated as migraine triggers. Poor sleep habits have been said to trigger migraines. Emotional stress as well, um, and weather changes have been reported as a trigger of migraines, although of course that's hard to verify with any kind of scientific study. Hormone or um, hormone changes have been associated with migraines. This includes menstruation in women, as well as hormone intake, such as oral contraceptive pills have been known to trigger and initiate migraines. Now, one of the older theories for migraine initiation was vasodilation. And um, it's still relevant. There's still a bunch of literature on it. There's still a lot of research. Um, but we're not exactly sure if vasodilation is the cause of the migraine or if it's an epiphenomenon, if it's something that occurs concurrently with the migraine. But I'm listing it here just to be complete, just in case. The idea is that you have dilation of intracranial blood vessels. And when you have dilation of these blood vessels, it activates the meningeal nociceptors that initiate the migraine. Remember that nociceptors are pain receptors. So if you're initiating meningeal pain receptors, that's gonna be painful. It can cause a headache, and that headache might manifest as migraines. Another um, common pathway in the, in the studies these days is the trigeminovascular pathway. The idea here is that you have activation of the trigeminal neurons. This results in the release of vasoactive peptides. This includes substance P and CGRP. And these do a couple things. They firstly dilate the intracranial blood vessels. Um, so that's, that might be the, epi the epiphenomenon of vasodilation. But they also trigger the release of pro-inflammatory molecules. This includes histamine, bradykinin, serotonin, and prostaglandin. And these pro-inflammatory molecules do exactly what they're supposed to. They cause neurogenic inflammation, which then activates your meningeal pain receptors and initiates the migraine. So that's another method through the activation of trigeminal neurons. Another pathway is uh, called the cortical spreading depression. This is when you have a wave of depolarization in the cerebral cortex. And what this essentially does is cause a wave of excitation of neural, of neuronal activity, followed by suppression of neuronal activity. This also triggers the release of pro-inflammatory molecules. Now there are a couple other factors that contribute to the initiation of migraines. Dysregulation of pain sensitization in the cranial nerve five trigeminal system is thought to play a role and this can directly impact neurogenic inflammation. This also causes a few symptoms that we'll see when we talk about the manifestations. So we'll get to those in just a little bit. There's a pretty significant genetic predisposition to migraines. Uh, up to 70% of people that have migraines have a family member, a direct relative, that also suffered from migraines. And these are also tied to the potential triggers that we listed above. But the genetic predisposition leads you to have a hyperexcitable brain, which then initiates the migraine. Lastly, we believe that many of these potential triggers might activate the autonomic nervous system. When that happens, it increases the parasympathetic tone throughout the body, which can also lead to some of the symptoms that are manifested in migraines. So that's the etiology. It's quite complicated, um, and unfortunately, we don't have one set central theory quite yet. 
but it's a working theory and we have a lot of the pieces there. Next, let's talk about the manifestations. You can break down the manifestation of a migraine into different stages, the prodrome, the aura, the headache, and the postdrome. Now you don't necessarily have all of these stages. In fact, only 25-ish percent of people report having an aura or are able to identify a specific aura for their migraine. The prodrome and the postdrome are also kind of optional. Um, you, you might have them, you might have them in retrospect, you might not realize that you're in a prodrome before having the headache, but it can also help you identify when a migraine is coming and can help you identify when you should be taking medication to prevent um, the migraine from getting worse. So um, we'll list them all here, but know that you don't necessarily have them all with every migraine attack. Let's start with the prodrome. This is a series of symptoms that happens one to two days before the headache starts, and we already have change in appetite and yawning here, so kind of subtle changes that you might notice. You might also notice difficulty reading and writing, as well as a change in mood. You might be happier, you might be sadder, you might be eating a lot, you might be eating a lot less. You might have difficulty concentrating, difficulty doing your work if it involves reading and writing. Next, let's talk about the aura. The most common auras are visual features. So these are like kind of weird visual features that you notice before the headache. And they happen in about 25% of people that get migraines and last under an hour before the headache. So usually about 30 minutes or so before the headache. They usually come on gradually and they're fully reversible. They go away completely, usually by the end of the headache. So the, one of the more common types of auras is, uh, is visual, as I mentioned. It's called scintillating scotoma. This is when you have a visual deficit that's arch-shaped, and it starts in the central um, part of your visual field and kind of works its way toward the peripheral part of your visual field. That's scintillating scotoma. You might have other visual changes. This can be flashing lights, flashing spots, flashing lines in your visual field. You can have just general blurry vision in one eye or both. You can have distorted color perception as well. Some non-visual symptoms, this includes numbness, paresthesias, or the pins and needles sensation, aphasia, and there are some atypical auras that have been reported, like paresis and dizziness, but these are pretty unusual, and they might uh, warrant further investigation to make sure there's not another neurological problem going on. So these are some of the aura conditions. You can also have lacrimation and nasal congestion at the end of the aura that kind of lead into the headache phase as well. Next, let's talk about the migraine headache itself. This is a primary headache, and this is kind of the main feature, the main symptom that people complain about. The headache usually lasts only four to 24 hours. I say only because um, it's short compared to the entire phase of the migraine, but that is quite a long time, and it, it can lead to a very debilitating state. It can, it can lead to quite a bit of suffering. Um, the headache is usually unilateral. It's especially in the frontal lobe, sometimes the frontotemporal lobe or retroorbital places on the head. The headache can be described as pulsating, throbbing, or pounding, and it's typically worse with physical activity. It's also typically associated with photophobia and phonophobia. So people don't want to deal with any lights, with any loud noises. Usually they shut themselves in a dark, quiet room and just try to sleep it off, just try to wait until the migraine goes away. There's sometimes associated nausea, <coughs> excuse me, nausea and vomiting here as well, and the patient can also have lacrimation and nasal congestion, as we mentioned. Lastly, let's get into the postdrome. This is just a series of features that happen once the, the headache has subsided. This can include exhaustion, including muscle weakness. Um, it can also include the opposite feeling. Patients can be a little euphoric. They might be more hungry. They might finally get their energy back. But in the long term, it can also cause fatigue, anxiety, depression. So really just a change in mood, a change in activity level, a change in appetite that happens after the headache is considered a postdrome for the migraine. So this has been a short overview of migraines. I hope it was helpful.